Hi, Dr. Patton. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Do you hear okay. me? Yes, wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for joining. Um, thank you, Dr. Patton, for joining us. This is, uh, so for everyone who is joining us, we are going to give like a couple of minutes for them to join. Um, this is going to be a really important and great conversation. Hi. Hello. Thanks for joining. Everyone is joining. Thank you. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, Aisha. Hi, Nirmin. Great. I'm glad that people are joining. Um, because it's a really important conversation and I, I would love for as many people to hear that. And um, I am Dr. Said Golami from I Care Better. Um, we have these regular uh, weekly conversations with experts in endometriosis from different perspectives and from different specialties. And this week, we are gonna have a conversation about the really important, important topics that everyone is learning a lot more every day about it and that's physical therapy and its importance in pain management and, and quality of life management and lifestyle management for patients with endometriosis and so with that uh, i would like to introduce dr uh, Patton, who has been an expert in physical therapy and endometriosis and she has been better to be to be uh, an endometriosis physical therapist for I Care Better. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Patton, I would love to hear about you and your work a little bit. I'm pretty sure audience would love to know about you. Hi, ah, yeah. I'll start talking about myself a little bit. Um, I have been a physical therapist for about seven years, and I opened my own practice last year, specializing in pelvic floor physical therapy, which inherently comes with treating endometriosis um, and comes with treating the post-operative and the pre-operative um, pain that a lot of my patients are having. So I'm really excited to have started this because I really get more autonomy and I get to kind of change the way things have been done and um, stir up the normal physical therapy world because certainly treating patients with endo is not... Uh, your average condition that you see. Yes, that's, um, so, you know, talking about that, Dr. Patton, um, I have to say it's one thing that I have, I have witnessed and I am very impressed. The same way that the patients with endometriosis probably have different complexities and different issues, they are very well read and knowledgeable about the disease. The question is always like, I go to patients to learn about so many things. That's amazing. And with that, I want to ask patients, please participate in this interview by posting your questions right here. We are planning to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, so start thinking about your question. And also as, as we move forward, you hear things, feel free. I know physical therapy for endometriosis might be a new topic, a new area for you. Just just move, just shoot your questions. If you have any problem with pain, with mobility, with quality of life, I'm pretty sure uh, Dr. Patton can help you with the answer or answer the questions directly, or at least directly in the direction that you can find an answer. And with that, I would love to start with a few questions about your personal story. Um, what, what was your first exposure with endometriosis? during your training. I'm really curious about that. Uh, I can tell you that for at least the first two years, I had all the wrong information. So it wasn't really until um, I specialized in pelvic health that I started to have patients with endo pain referred to me. Um, thank goodness for their patients and letting me be their practitioner because a lot of them taught me and gave me resources that I needed to give to other people. But basically what I started to realize when I started to get a lot of um, patients that had had endo, I noticed that they weren't all treated the same. So that kind of struck me right away as being um, 
kind of like a red flag. Like, why doesn't everyone get surgery? Or why are some people doing this type of treatment, this medical treatment? Um, why did they even send them to me? I was kind of confused. You know, not every one of my patients with endo have pelvic floor spasms, or that's not the driver of their pain. We have a lot of other sources of pain. So there was a lot of people in the beginning that I had to really learn how to think outside the box and how to help. Um, so thank goodness for my um, early exposure and people who were willing to tell me about resources. So probably the first resource I heard about was Nancy's Nook. And then from there, um, just like diving into my own research and, and then listening to my patients. I mean, the most important thing that we do is really actually taking the time to listen to someone's individual experiences. Uh, there was a lot of medical trauma, to be honest. Like there's a lot of, you know, patients having countless doctor visits that they felt like they were never listened to or heard. And so that really catches your attention when your patient is in so much distress that they just can't seem to put the pieces of the puzzle together. You really have to start to reach out of your network and figure out like who can team together to help this person. And what I found out very quickly with endo was that I'm not going to be doing it all myself. I'm going to have to have a team of people around me and I'm going to have to coordinate care between all of these different clinicians so that different people get all the services that they need. Yes, it's, you know, uh, I have to tell you, and also the people who are watching us, endometriosis and physical therapy is also a new field for myself to learn about. And it just amazes me what you just said is that the same way that surgeons don't get the training for endometriosis and they are lost and they have to go learn it by themselves, I just hear from you, you, pro, you kind of went through the same process. You, you learned it by yourself, by listening to patients. It's like you never were trained to how to, to deal with endometriosis patients. And in fact, you might have been trained in the wrong way. Is that, is that right? Was that, uh, was that accurate what I just said? Yeah, I definitely think that trained in the wrong way. Like when we, yeah, I think one of the biggest things that stands out to me is um, I had... I couldn't treat my patients the same way depending on if they were having a pelvic pain flare or if they weren't that you can't just say, Hey, this is your exercise protocol. Come in and do these exercises because one week to the next looks very different for that person. And so if you have the expectation of this like physical therapy climb where someone's improving constantly, you're definitely not going to get that with your endo patients. It's going to be, <laughs> a lot more of ups and downs, and you want to help them through that exacerbation period. Okay. Right. So now, so what we basically, endometriosis is, is a complex situation for pelvic physical therapies. Yeah. And part of it is because of the training that is not there, so you have to go through it by yourself, reading and learning from patients. Part of it is because it's a complex disease in nature. Um, so what, what made you to go through this complexity? I mean, you could go a thousand other ways. Right? You decided, no, I want to I wanna work with endometriosis patients. I'm yeah, really there's... curious if it takes some, some certain personalities to, to take up this challenge. Yeah, that's so true. I think I don't like seeing people in distress. And I think I'm always like pulled to the medical system in the terms of where it's not doing well. So I think anything like that just catches my attention. Um, I'm also now being, having practiced for enough years, you know, I think I'm a seasoned enough clinician that I don't, I don't um, take every um, situation as heavy with me. So I feel like I can sit with people and their pain a lot better and try to work through that. So I feel like I have a bigger capacity as a clinician now, having worked with patients with endo, because it has really taught me so much about, you know, how the body works and how we can communicate on our internal system. I think I'm just, a, I think I'm always just interested in the most difficult thing. Yeah. 
I mean, that's great. Uh, look, every, I think every one of us, uh, including patients, we, we really want to deal with the complexity and, and the complexity is part of the thing that everyone is dealing with. And I, I really believe um, we are lucky in the community to have, to have you and people like you to take up the challenge because not everyone is up for the challenge. And thank you. And with that, I'm going to jump into a couple of questions about about physical therapy and endometriosis, especially when a patient comes out of excision surgery and they still have persistent pain. I know many people would think like excision surgery is like this whole the standard of care and if you go through it, it's gonna be boom, you are healed and no pain tomorrow. But, but in reality, reality is different, right? People come out, they are gonna still have some pain might be a reduced level or even like the same level of pain and it might take mm -hmm. a while for them to reduce. I want, I want to ask for, like, for your opinion about that. Like, what is the source or what are the sources of this persistent pain after someone does an excision surgery with a good expert? I mean, what's, what's, mm -hmm. um, what are the sources? Yeah, I mean, quickly before I answer that question, just to kind of paint a picture people are not getting their diagnosis is right for possibly a decade. That means repetitive, chronic stress on the body that their autonomic nervous system is now protecting them. If you can imagine, you know, we know what the endo belly looks like, we've seen it, and that clenching of the abdominal muscles, the protecting of the body, someone's going through that for a decade or more, and it's just getting progressively more intense and closer together and more frequent. So by the time you have adequate excision surgery, their bodies have no idea at what to do with that afterwards. So usually what I hear from my patients after they've had an, a good excision surgery is that they have noticed things are better. There's symptoms that have definitely improved and they don't feel as debilitated in their daily activities but that doesn't mean that they feel great they usually are like maybe still sitting constantly maybe at like a four out of ten pain and then they still have pain flares so i think that you know one of the pieces that we always look at is pelvic floor muscles so that's definitely something that you need to go to a specialty therapist for that's trained in pelvic floor physical therapy um, but it's not just only pelvic floor muscles. So we're definitely getting other referred pain. One of the things I think about the most is the diaphragm. And so if you think about the pelvic floor being at the base, we're talking about managing a pressure system between the diaphragm on top and the pelvic floor on the bottom. And sometimes we're even talking about the pressure system up above that, you know, into the chest and the epiglottis. And we're talking about an entire pressure system in your body. And when that pressure system isn't moving or isn't functioning properly, that comes with a lot of visceral pain, organ pain, that comes with diaphragm pain, that comes with pain with breathing, that comes with um, pelvic pain. And so basically what, what we think of, when I think of the diaphragm, I think of all its attachments to our organs and our spine. You know, it connects to your heart, your liver, your spleen, your, your transverse colon, your, um, the back of your spine, and your entire bottom half of the rib cage. So if the diaphragm had trouble moving, which why would it not have trouble moving? Because someone's been in debilitating pain, but they've had endometriosis, which essentially is creating adhesions anywhere in the pelvis or the abdomen or other places, or even in the diaphragm itself that muscle no longer can do, it's like pumping action. So I think that's a big source of pain. And the diaphragm, if a diaphragm isn't moving, the pelvic floor isn't doing its job either. And these, these organs and these muscles are really important for lymphatic flow and vascularization. You know, <laughs> our pelvic floor literally pumps vascular and lymphatic flow back into our vena cava. And so we need these muscles to move. And these aren't all musculoskeletal things. We are, are talking about nerves and we're talking about organs. But any of these structures 
could be a possible source of referred pain. In addition to that, I really think that a lot of pain comes from just an upregulation of the central nervous system. And what that means is, you know, again, being in a state of chronic pain means that there's been a lot of medical exams that patients haven't felt comfortable with, and they've had a lot of medical experiences that have been overwhelming. So sometimes they come into my office and like, they're already feeling unsafe just by being there because being in a medical office feels unsafe. So we had got to retrain the nervous system to start to feel safe again. So sometimes I actually start, you know, with helping people stay grounded in their bodies and just feeling a connection to like, where is their pressure? Where is their softness? Um, paying attention to what does it feel like to actually stay present in your body? You know, so many of my patients, when they come in, they're used to an exam by uh, maybe a gynecologist, or they're used to exam by a pelvic pain specialist, but we do our exams very differently than that. And mine's a lot more, um, it's a lot more slow paced because I don't have like an end goal. My goal is to help them stay present in their body while I'm doing an exam. And it's not quick and um, that people don't know how to stop necessarily when they're having pain, they're used to pushing through. So a lot of times I say, if your gut instinct is to stop and or your, it's a push through this pain, I'm going to be checking in with you. And I might even stop the exam before you think that you need to stop the exam because I feel your muscles just kind of being overwhelmed. So I think all of these things kind of participate with um, the cycle of pain that has been present for so long. And the excision surgery is really just the first great step. It's like the first big affirming step that gives people like, okay, I had this adhesion over here and I had this cyst and I had what grade of endometriosis, and now it's taken out, but now we have a chance to actually retrain the whole system to function better. Right, right, that's, you know, that's an incredible uh, structure that we have. I really, I, I literally learned so many things from you. So basically I'm just trying to understand by myself. Uh, these pelvic and abdomen are, are Basically, their boundary is the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. So we have a couple of issues. One, one the diaphragm muscles and pelvic floor muscles are going to be spas spasmatic or and spasmic, and they are going to be painful. And also the nerves and everything are going to be dysregulated. And a lot of people also get like, as you said, they get this disconnect with their body, and the, they can probably they they have work to do to understand their body well and the, the situation. And that's what you see as the source of pain after an excision surgery because you know i have to tell you i don't know I'm, it's a it's a really it's something that i'm really working on to to understand that many patients when go when they come out of excision surgery they feel pain they still feel they, they feel guilty and they they feel they have to take the blame because they still have that pain whereas like there is a very clear scientific explanation. I mean, you just put it out there for that thing. So for you patients, like if, if anyone has that situation, you see there is a reason and that reason can, add, can be addressed, which is my basically next question. And can you explain to us like, what a physical therapist do, uh, does uh, for a patient after excision and, and how effective is that? And just open the box for us. Many of us don't even know what's going to happen and what's happening in physical therapy after excision of endometriosis. Definitely. So, I mean, on the first session, what I start with is I want to hear their story. The easiest part of my job is just being an affirming person and healthcare provider in that experience. Um, and I think right off the bat, if you are that provider, that already creates a safety for the patient to just like, they don't have to prove anything to you, which is really interesting how people in that situation, because they've been gaslit, you know, maybe for so long, they might come into the appointment, like feeling like I need to, I, I'm going to show you and validate, like, I need, I need this validated or, 
you know, a hundred percent, like your pain is valid just by you having said it. And so what I usually um, explain to people is I don't need to reproduce your pain to know that it's true and know that it's there. Um, my intention is actually to make you feel more comfortable and make your body feel safe. It's not to like poke on a muscle and reproduce your pain and say, oh, if I just keep poking on it, it's going to go away. <laughs> That's definitely not how it's going to work. And unfortunately, there are um, people that treat that way and especially for endo types of pain that's not going to be the answer um so the first is i want to explain to somebody um all the connections of their body because usually they're like i don't know my bladder hurts um and i feel like i still have a hesitation to pee and also um, it hurts up into my abdomen and so what i want to show people is how connected all of these things are i want to show them you know, what I do often is I, I just take my pelvic model and it has all the structures and I just show people how close together things are. And then also where the nerves from the lumbar and the sacral plexus, those are nerves from the spine, where they innervate all through the body. So I show them the pathway of the nerve that they're talking about. So if someone is like, oh, I have groin pain and also it hurts when I flex my hip, that actually makes a lot of sense but it might not make sense to them. So I want to explain the anatomy behind some of these um, complaints that they're having so that they can see these are all interrelated problems. And once we start fixing one, a lot of other things start to start to fall into place a lot better. Mm -hmm. So um, the, that's the beginning. The beginning is just explaining, validating pain, and then explaining the connection of the body. And then once we do an exam, we start to have a baseline, kind of what are the pelvic floor muscles doing? How are you breathing? Um, where in your abdomen and your back does it still hurt? And we start to find connections on how the body is now moving. So, um, you know, if the right side had a lot of endo, we might find that they can't rotate to the left, they can't side bend to the left, and they don't want to extend backwards. All of that makes sense if right if the right lower quadrant has been really painful and had a lot of endo around it. So those are just some really basic examples. We want to get a full movement screen. We want to treat the whole body. And then we want to find out individually for that person what types of treatment feel best for them. And so what that means is, like, sometimes I'm doing really, really gentle treatments because that feels safest at first. And other times I'm doing more aggressive treatments because Maybe someone is feeling a little bit numb everywhere and they um, need to feel a little bit more input before they feel like they're making progress. And so in either condition, it just needs to be um, fluid and fluctuating. And then um, we can start to retrain the nervous system to start to pay attention to when are you, you know, so let's say I found that someone was tensing up their pelvic floor muscles. And um, they, the first question usually that someone says, after I tell them that, well, how do I make it stop? And that's a really bad question, right? Like, how do you make it stop? Well, the first part of that is um, when you're sitting in your day, I want you to stop everything that you're doing and just check in with your body. You might find that you weren't intentionally doing it, but a lot of people are clenching their pelvic floor, even when they're not really noticing that that was something that they were um, consciously doing. And so just starting to help people help people pay attention to their symptoms in the day, then they can start to catch their body when it's doing it. You know, if it would be the same if you were grinding your teeth at night, you would want to uh, or in the daytime, you would want to start to pay attention to like when you were grinding your teeth and the pelvic floor is really no different from that. And then we just kind of build on body awareness. Right. So it's so in this process. So the process is you make them aware of the body. You find where the limitations or the where the pain is pain is based on that pe person's experience, uh, and you work on that based on your experience with your own patients. Uh, how effective are these strategies for your patients, and in what period do they? Do they take their best effect? Like how, how many sessions or how many months or weeks after 
will start. <laughs> the procedure is going gonna, is gonna to show its impact for the patient. I mean, I think the first session, honestly, is so impactful in the simple fact that it's just very validating to explain the why behind someone's connectedness to their body. And um, to me, that just instantly, I feel like, changes their perspective of, like, the hopefulness of pain treatment, right? So, I, I mean, everyone is so different. Um, I would say the main difference between, say, like an orthopedic surgery and excision, endo excision, which, you know, if we're kind of breaking up physical therapy, um, there's a big difference between the type of treatments that might arise. And so what I find with my post excision um, patients is that um, a typical ortho protocol doesn't really work in the sense of a lot of those protocols are like two times a week. And I find that my patients post-op endo um, surgery are really feeling like that's overwhelming to their system. So remember that we're trying to make changes, but we don't want to overwhelm the nervous system so much that everything is changing all at once. So I really don't like to see people two times a week. I like to spread it out a little bit more. So maybe I would start as, as close together as once a week, possibly, but I have patients that only come in once a month and we are making great progress and they are making fantastic progress, even with that low frequency, which before I would have thought, oh, that's not often enough. We're not getting at things, but honestly, it gives their system time to integrate. And so I think if you're um, a physical therapist that has been in the ortho world, and you're transitioning to this pelvic health, chronic pain, endometriosis type of sim symptoms, really start to expand your understanding of how frequent does a patient really need to come into your office and what feels right for them. Because now we're thinking about, we're thinking about finances. That's a huge one. We're thinking about, does their body feel touched out, you know, touched out as in just can't tolerate any more touch. Um, so we don't want to point those appointments too close together and then giving their system time to integrate all of these changes that they might feel from one session to the next. So the frequency of treatment is very variable, but when I find that I ask people what feels right for them, the ch I think the plan of care goes so much better in terms of how quickly they get better because they I've just given them a choice and they kind of were a participant in their healthcare plan. And I think that's huge to someone having a trajectory that it's not like me just coming into the office and saying, all right, so now the protocol is you're going to come in twice a week and mm -hmm. you're going to do all these exercises. I don't like that mindset and it doesn't seem to work and people get very overwhelmed and then they feel like they failed. I don't really feel like anyone ever fails, but people feel like they failed physical therapy and maybe they just haven't found the right provider or the right person with the right knowledge for them. It's not a matter of passing or failing physical therapy. And then I would also say that in terms of effectiveness, I don't really ever, you know, we do discharge, I do discharge people and I say, you're doing great right now. Keep up the good work. You know, I'll see you in six months. Let's set an appointment for six months. You integrate everything that we've just talked about. And then we'll have new goals in six months from now. Or hey, you're doing great. Call me when, I don't know, you have a flare up if that happens and we'll navigate that together. So as, as much as I would love to say there's like a clear start and end, there's really not. It's kind of just um, imagining that you're going to stay with somebody possibly, you know, for as long as you're an available practitioner for them. Right. Um, this will be to piggyback on what you just said, I have heard this from so many patients who work with physical therapists who have experience in endometriosis, and they really, they are the biggest advocates. These patients, they say, like, working with physical therapy on a consistent basis, some of them short term, some of them longer term, has really helped them keep the pain level low and the quality of life high and the mobility at a standard, reserve level. And I totally hear you, this, this could be different, could be weekly, monthly, and after a while, it could be every six months or a year. But yes, this is something that I, see, I have heard from patients that this really impacted their life in a in big way. I think 
it has not been uh, introduced well enough or it has not been broadcasted well enough to the community like how important this could be the physical therapy could be for the quality of life and afterward and with that being said i would like to invite everyone who is in this session to ask a question any questions that you have about physical therapy no question is too dumb to ask like every question matters just ask your questions we have dr patton here and she has been kind and i'm pretty sure um uh, i i would be happy i'm pretty sure she would be also happy to answer your question this is a this is a this is a newer field for endometriosis so just drop your question whatever you wanna and i already have a couple of questions i started those questions um <laughs> so the first question is do you recommend pelvic pt before excision surgery i do i mean i think you want to go into surgery feeling your best and just being aware of some muscle guarding, being aware of um, how your breathing mechanics are, be, being aware of your movement patterns, being aware of that pressure system, um, I think is it great to review and go over and have a, at least a few treatments before someone goes into excision surgery. Um, so I'm an advocate for that. I know that's not realistic for everybody, but um, you know, even if you were to do like a telehealth session with a provider, I think that could go a long way to just um, kind of helping you go into surgery with a little bit of ease. And then you have a support system ready and waiting for you when you come out of surgery. And it's a team, it's a team effort. Everything's a team effort. So even what I find, I can communicate with the, um, the surgeon. And I, I think that it requires a lot of um, effort to be a connected team for one person. Right, pretty, like, totally important, totally agree. Build that rapport before the surgery. So you, after surgery, you just fall back on the support system that you have already built. So this is, uh, the next question is, someone is asking, I had surgery seven weeks ago for endometriosis, and I'm starting pelvic floor therapy. Any questions I should ask my physical therapist? Well, that's a great one. Um, I would say you can ask them what their experience is with treating endo. Um, and if they have like kind of um, a, a skill set that they feel like really participates with some of their endo treatments, um, you know, they should be checking obviously pelvic floor muscles. They should be checking out your breathing. I, I believe that every one of my patients, um, I look at their abdomen. I'm, and what I mean by that is I'm looking at how structures move. I'm looking at the position of their rib cage. And your physical therapist should be treating your whole body. So if you have pain that's not, you know, in the abdomen or the pelvic floor, you should still be bringing that up and, and mentioning it so that it can be addressed as well. Right. Another question, just based on how we ask questions from physical therapists, could be like how many endometriosis patients have you had? Because, because that's important. Yeah. As you said, it's so different to have. Can you explain on that? Like, how, why is different? Why is it important to have, to have to make sure someone understands endometriosis from the beginning? I mean, you you want to know how your the experience of your practitioner, and that's a very valid question. Again, um, I think transparency is always kind of the best motto. So in the early days when I had no idea and I didn't understand endo and I didn't understand all the complexities that came around with it, you know, my patients knew that they didn't, uh, they didn't peace out because maybe I was the only one that was accessible for them, but they did educate me and I was willing to listen and work with them. So even if your practitioner doesn't have a ton of um, experience, if you feel comfortable with them and you trust their knowledge and they make you feel safe, I think you should, um, give that a chance and then maybe you can even continue to adv advocate and educate them on endo and en endo in general but yeah I would say that if you're really looking to not um, not I guess like shop around for physical therapists you can do a phone screen and on that phone screen just say hey on average like how often do you treat patients who have experienced endo and endo excision surgeries? 
And that number, you know, I would say at any given time, I probably have at least like seven to 10 patients on my caseload that are in the process of waiting for surgery or have just gotten out of surgery or are even a couple years out of surgery. And I would say that that's, that's average for me, but um, I don't know. I don't see, um, I have a lower caseload, but I think that that's pretty much someone who has, is really seeing a lot of endo patients. Great, thank you. The other question is, uh, what would you want a brand new endo patient who has never had pelvic floor PT to know before the first appointment? Yeah, definitely. Well, you should know that your pelvic floor muscles are not able to be assessed through your clothes. So that means that you want to mentally prepare that your physical therapist may recommend an um, an exam which involves taking your pants off and doing an internal um, vaginal or rectal exam. And that doesn't have to happen on the first session. You should just, I mean, if you're trying to think of the things that you should know, you should know that the pelvic floor muscles are assessed um, intravaginally and intrarectally, and that treatment should not be painful. Um, that can provoke a little bit of symptoms, but it, um, your, your clinician should really take you through that entire process of what that looks like. But I think that that is something, you know, I have on my website in my frequently asked questions, like, how do you even look at the pelvic floor muscles? You should know that that's um, an exam that might feel too invasive and that might feel overwhelming. So you might want to communicate that you might not be ready for that exam on the first day and that you want to take it in another direction or um, you want to build up to that exam. Okay, great. And the next question is, uh, is there any red flags or important questions, basically red flags that patients should look at when they are trying to pick a physical a pelvic floor physical therapy? I think red flags are someone that is telling you that there's like this very specific protocol and especially that this like two or three times a week appointment thing is like needed to feel better that I just don't feel like that's realistic at all. And I think that's kind of in the ortho physical therapy world where we like someone's had surgery. So we're like, all right, they've had surgery. Let's get to it. Uh, I don't find that. I think that would be a red flag for me because I think anyone who's been treating patients who have excision surgeries long enough knows that not many people are going to be able to tolerate that level of intensity. And then another red flag would be just anyone who dismisses your pain and anyone who it doesn't matter that um, they just don't have to be right for you. So you don't have to find like a character flaw. They can be a genuinely good person and good practitioner. But if it just doesn't feel right for you, you really don't need to have any more excuse than that to just say like, this doesn't feel right. I'm just going to start some going to somebody else. Okay. Amazing. So basically, if they dismiss the pain, that's one red flag. The other part is if they go too aggressive on the initial phase, like not considering, like they not considering the amount of pressure and and trauma that they have been through. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, what if I am flaring every time after PT? What kind of therapy should I be doing post op? It's a mistake I made often. I mean, this is why I'm saying what I'm saying now is because in the beginning, I treated people too often. I treated people too aggressively and they were having lots of pain flares after physical therapy. Um, that happens a lot less for me now, now that I understand the entirety of the nervous system. I recognize my patient's trauma responses a lot better. And so um, I would love to say that that's something that is... Um, it's just something that a practitioner has to learn. And so I, I would say that you have to communicate your symptoms after your pelvic PT session with your practitioner. And if they don't have a different plan of care based on that in terms of frequency or treatment, then you're looking at somebody else. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, um, 
after surgery, what's a relative right time to start some physical therapy? Like how long after the surgery is the right mm -hmm. time for them to start? I would say average is around six weeks. Um, certainly I have people come in later than that. Um, on on um, individual cases, I'll consider sooner than six weeks as long as I've talked to the surgeon. Um, and sometimes we really just start off gentle in terms of helping the nervous system feel safe, working on breathing mechanics and just very gentle active mobility, which is nothing more than someone would do in their regular day. So we're not stressing any of the things that are healing. So um, six weeks, unless, you know, there's a more individual um, communication between the physical therapist and the surgeon that says, yeah, you can do this sooner than that. Okay, great. So the next question is, if someone is waiting for a surgery, has typical pain for endometriosis, but hasn't done a surgery, no diagnosis yet, but probably she assumes she has endometriosis and the surgery is probably in a year or two. Is there anything that you as a physical therapist can do for these type of patients before the surgery to, to, pain, to manage their pain? Yeah, lots of educate. I mean, first of all, lots of education. I if someone you know hasn't you know suspected endo diagnosis and they're waiting on excision surgery, I teach my patients how to talk to their employer. I teach them how to talk to their partner in terms of communicating needs and what to expect from them. I mean, if you're going to be having a pain flare at least minimum, right, once a month or more often as they get unfortunately closer together sometimes, or sometimes there's no break, but you are going to have to have some tough conversations with people so that you are not um, draining your energy and draining yourself or expecting yourself to work really hard on days when you need a break. So culturally that gets really difficult because, you know, some people have never been used to having boundaries like that before. And this is the first time they have their body is telling them, I can't physically do it. So I think the first part of that is like validating that you shouldn't push through um, just to push through. And in terms of physical therapy treatment, creating a plan that kind of synchronizes up with their pain flares. So that looks different for everybody. But sometimes I'll ask people, you know, depending on how your pain flare looks, some people want treatment during that time, they want to come in and they want to just feel a little bit better and they want to help their nervous system not feel as guarded. Other people are like, I am not moving those two days or those three days or whatever it is. And I'll come in right after that pain flare is like on is coming down and then we'll do treatment at that time. So we kind of find some synchronization and everyone's a little bit different on when they want treatment in that cycle. But I still think that there's plenty of pain management strategies that we can do um, leading up to surgery and then just really helping them be aware that um, there are going to be days that they have to not push their body. Okay. Yes, that's great because many people have lack of access to endometriosis or, you know, lack of affordability. People might not be able to afford surgery, especially good quality. So it's important to have pre-surgical understanding and pre-surgical care from a physical therapist. Thank you for bringing, for, for mentioning the solutions and the impacts that you can make. Someone is asking, so first of all, before I ask this question, I should say uh, we don't give medical advice directly to people. It's just answering questions in a generic way. The next question is asking about a very specific tip. This probably I would say this answer is what you, what you, what you would do to a patient that you see but so the question is can you give an example of an exercise i have very painful periods can't get out of bed for five days could physical therapy help two questions basically yeah so yes physical therapy can definitely help um i would recommend your first visit not being during a pain flare and being in between um, maybe at least like maybe on the coming down side of that pain flare because you'll be more able to focus and communicate with your physical therapist on that first session. Um, some exercises, you know, some exercises that I 
really like to show people are um, diaphragm breathing. So what happens when you're using your diaphragm for your breath versus your chest, it, it means you're taking your breath into your stomach instead of, instead of your breath looking like, I'm going to exaggerate, but instead of your breath looking up here in your neck and your chest, you're actually going to take your inhale through your nose and you're going to take it into your stomach. And that helps gently expand the pelvic floor. You're not even trying to move your pelvic floor. It just is expanding because there's pressure in the pelvic bowl. And then you exhale and just feel everything gently relax. And so the breathing is the foundation to everything. So some added moves that I would do on that would be any yoga stretch that you feel like is comfortable. So I usually start um, my patients in um, maybe a hook, they're laying on their back and their knees are bent and they're just rocking their knees side to side. And then they're practicing that breath along with it. Um, another position uh, is child's pose. So you're on your hands and knees and you sink your hips back to your feet and you just stretch your arms out and you bring the head down and you let the head relax. And you're practicing this nice deep breath along with the muscle relaxation that you get from your um, abdomen and pelvic floor. And someone just mentioned happy baby pose. Absolutely. When you're on your back, you're going to try to bring your legs towards your ears. And again, you can just do some rocking motions. You're trying to really calm down the whole system of your body because any if any of these stretches like feel super, super intense, you can just ease off of them or ease into them as you feel comfortable. Um, but another thing I would say is any type of rotation, because we're, when we're talking about the diaphragm, which is attaching into the thoracic spine, the main movement of the thoracic spine is going to be to rotate. So even just by reaching your arm behind you, you're actually mobilizing your diaphragm and you're mobilizing some of the organs that are attached to your diaphragm. So those are some places I start um, for very basic exercises. But you, if that person, I think that person deserves hopefully um, some personalized treatment if they have access to it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so I don't see uh, any, any more questions here. We answered a lot of questions. I have to tell you there, a lot of points that you brought up was for me, and I'm reading endometriosis every single day, was the first time to learn about. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of work to do to educate the community and to educate ourselves as providers and, and in people who are making some changes and impacts. And thank you so much for your time. Um, how patients yes. can, can find you, how they can if they want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, the easiest way is on my website. Um, it's Patton, P-A-T-T-O-N, it's my name, pelvichealth.com. And if you go into the section, there's a free consult and you can fill out that form and I'll contact you. Um, if you even want to go into my scheduling section, there's um, a section where you can schedule a free phone consult and I would say do the phone consult first because I would love to get to know you and talk to you first before I schedule anybody. Um, that's just my preference. And another way is you can stay up. I'm, I'm sort I'm on Instagram. I wouldn't say like I'm a poster or I'm a social media person, but I, I try to um, share information that I feel like is relevant when I have the energy to do so. So you can always message me on Instagram if that is your way of communicating as well. Awesome. And someone just asked, is there any list? I Care Better is, is creating a list and has a growing list. Dr. Patton is one of the top vetted experts on that. So iCareBetter.com, we, we vet endometriosis, physical therapists to make sure they have the knowledge and experience of endometriosis. And uh, so that's, if you go there, you can find a list of endometriosis physical therapists that you can find their phone number and their philosophy of care and their experience. Many things about them that you might be curious about before you make a decision. So you can also go to I Care Better. And Dr. Patton has been one of the best and earliest and earliest doctors that have joined us. And we are so honored uh, to have her. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope 
everyone got some good information and they can take it with them. Yes, thank you, Dr. Patton, and thank you everyone for joining. I hope to see you in our next session. Mm -hmm. We will make the pub, a public announcement before uh, that session, so you could join us. Thank you and take care, everyone. Have a good day. Bye, thank you. Good day or night. Bye bye.